Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Constangi's webinar, Buckle Up California 2023 is almost here. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is approved for SHRM credit and is pending approval for HRCI and California CLE credit. We will provide the SHRM and HRCI codes to you at the end of the presentation, so please stick around in order to get those. If you have questions, please submit them through the chat function. You can access the chat through the toolbar located at the bottom of your screen. Laura and Corey will leave some time at the end to answer your questions. Lastly, we will be providing a copy of the PowerPoint used during today's webinar and a recording of the presentation. These materials will be sent to you once the recording has been uploaded by tomorrow afternoon. Today's presenters are Constangi partners, Laura De Leon and Corey King. Laura is an experienced trial lawyer and client advocate, splitting her time between our Orange County, California and San Antonio, Texas offices. Her extensive career has involved representing companies of all sizes across many industries and all aspects of employment law. Laura has successfully defended clients in the courtroom before administrative agencies and on appeal. In addition to litigation, Laura has spent her extensive career partnering with clients to counsel them through complex issues involving discrimination, harassment, retaliation, accommodations, and wage and hour compliance. Laura is an accomplished speaker and presenter, having presented on cutting edge employment law topics at local and national events, as well as many online forums. Laura is licensed to practice law in both California and Texas and is board certified in labor and employment law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Corey is a partner located in our San Diego office. He is an experienced litigator who focuses his practice on helping his clients through the variety of employment law issues facing employers today. Corey has experience with wage hour, including class action and PAGA claims, harassment, discrimination, wrongful termination, whistleblower, breach of contract, unfair competition, and trade secret disputes. He has represented employers in both state and federal courts, private arbitration, and in administrative proceedings with state and federal agencies. I'm now going to turn it over to Laura and Corey. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Very glad that you're able to join us for our annual uh, summary of new and interesting employment law that are affecting our California employers. Uh, Corey and I are going to be taking you through a lot of uh, new legislation today, as well as update you on some recent court decisions uh, from the California Supreme Court and also give you some of our thoughts on uh, some practical takeaways from each of these. Um, and I have to be honest with you, I thought that this legislative session was a little bit underwhelming until I started looking into things and preparing for this presentation. And I thought, oh my gosh, there is quite a bit of um, little sleeper hits uh, that the legislature put through. Uh, what we're gonna try to do, we're, we're gonna hit the high notes. I mean, some of the legislation that we thought was very key and the most important for the broad variety of our clients and employers to pay attention to. Um, there might be some, some other uh, laws out there that we're not uh, you know, covering, you know, um, but, but these are definitely the high notes and the ones that we think are the ones that deserve um, your most attention as we kind of wind down this year and get ready for 2023. So, Talking about key new statutes impacting employers, uh, the first one that we wanted to talk to you about is SB 1162, and that is the new pay transparency changes that the legislature has put into effect. Um, and this uh, particular bill addresses two aspects of our California law. One is the government code section that addresses the annual pay data reporting um, that um, employers have had to make over the last two years. Um, the other is it uh, uh, involves changes to the California Fair, um, uh, the pay equity law um, and changes to that. So at a very high level, starting this January 1, um, employers in California, um, our job postings must include as part of the posting, the pay scale for the position uh, in question. Um, employers must also provide employees with the pay scale for their position upon request. Um, and we'll go into these a little bit detail in subsequent slides. 
The um, new law also addresses uh, record retention and inspection rules and attributes certain penalties for non-compliance. And it also, as I alluded to, um, has increased and changed the annual reporting requirements on pay equity. So the first question that I've been getting about uh, SB 1162 is what the heck is a pay scale? Um, the law just defines it as the salary, the salary or hourly wage rate that the employer reasonably expects to pay for the position. That's kind of all we get. Um, so I know this is something that some employers tend to struggle with if they are smaller or they don't have established pay scale practices. Um, I would advise you that in these waning months of 2022, this is something that you and your compensation teams should really look at to try to align on ahead of time so that you are ready to go come the new year with all your job postings. Um, I would say it needs to be reasonable. I have heard of some employers being a little cheeky and saying we pay somewhere between you know, zero and a million dollars. Um, that might be inviting uh, discord and attention that is unwanted. Um, do your best. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you, you should really engage with your comp group. Um, there are a lot of outside consultants that can help you establish pay ranges. But in any event, that is sort of the biggest um, issue of concern or one of the bigger issues of concern that employers have voiced uh, with respect to these new requirements. So as mentioned, you have to include the pay scale for a position in any job posting now. This requirement applies to those of you who have 15 or more employees. It applies to both internal postings as well as external postings. Um, and it also includes postings made through a third party. So if you do LinkedIn or job boards or you know, any other sort of electronic or paper posting, this needs to be a component of that posting. Put it somewhere between the job requirements and the affirmative action employer, EOE, bird seed that you have at the end, um, but it does need to be included on your postings. And remember, this goes for internal postings as well. So if you do those electronically through some sort of ATS or other sort of um, electronic system, you wanna make sure that you include it there as well. Now, you must maintain the records of job title and wage rate history for each employee now uh, for the duration of employment plus three years after that employment ends. And these records um, shall be open to inspection upon request by the labor commissioner. Um, now, this might seem easy enough, a lot of us have electronic databases, HRIS systems, um, or payroll systems that maintain this data. Um, the big issue that um, I can foresee happening with this is having historical data for longer term employees um, or issues where employers, you might be changing your payroll system, your payroll provider, or changing your HRIS system, and somehow not thinking about the need to retain access to your historical data. Um, it's actually um, come up before where um, someone changes an HRIS system and the prior system owners delete the data or will make it available to employer only at a very high cost. So try to keep that in mind as you're changing your providers. You wanna try and put something in there that allows you to either maintain that data or have access to that data going forward um, so you don't get into trouble uh, with this record keeping requirement. Now, with respect to um, requesting requests for pay data information or pay scale information, existing law um, had already said that on reasonable request, employers have to provide the pay scale for a position to an applicant um, uh, applying for employment. Um, this uh, amendment now has added to that. Well, it actually changed this requirement just a little bit, but it also added a new requirement that employers now need to provide uh, this information to an employee um, who is, but it is somewhat limited to the employee asking for the pay scale for their own job. Um, you know, if you have someone who's a nosy Nelly who comes in and, you know, wants to see the entire pay scale for the whole company, that's a little bit outside the scope of this particular provision. Um, what I found kind of interesting about this is that 
it left in the language about how an applicant's request must be reasonable, um, but it doesn't define what a reasonable request is, but it indicates an employer must provide um, the information to a current employee only upon request. So, you know, to me, I'm thinking, is that an unreasonable request? What does that mean? Um, but in any event, we now have to make this data available to current employees. Um, what's interesting also is that unlike the rules regarding personnel file access or, um, or wage statement access, there's no deadline by which an employer needs to provide this information. There's no information we're given about how we need to provide this, whether it's in writing or verbally. Um, I would suggest you provide something in writing or at least an acknowledgement that this information was given in writing so that if the issue comes up later, you can prove that yes, the employee requested it and here's what we provided. Um, but, um, but, you know, not to overcomplicate the situation, just know now that we would need to provide this pay scale information to a current employee um, upon request. So with respect to enforcement, um, an employee can file a complaint with the labor commissioner. Labor commissioner can subject a, an employer to a civil penalty between $110,000 uh, per, per violation. Um, there's no penalty if the employer can show that all of their job postings um, have been updated to reflect the pay scale. Um, an employee can also bring action for injunctive relief in court and also ask for any other relief the court deems appropriate. Um, and then what's interesting is that if an employer fails to keep records in violation of this particular section, there's a rebuttable presumption in favor of the employee's claim. Um, turning now to the changes to the annual pay data reporting, um, you know that, or most of you should know, uh, that have had to grapple with this the last two years. Um, this is a pretty complex um, issue. Um, I'm not going to go through the existing law. I just want to hit on the changes to this. Um, the department does have, um, in, in my opinion, a very good web page uh, with FAQs and forms and files that can help you comply with this annual reporting. I checked this morning. They still have not updated anything to account for these changes for 2023. Um, the good news is, is that we have until the second Wednesday of May to comply. So you do have some time um, in order to get everything together to file those initial reports under this new law. Um, so I would say stay tuned on that, but, but the resources that I've seen thus far have been remarkably helpful. Um, so my hope is that they will similarly update them uh, going forward. So yes, so the new deadline is going to be the second Wednesday in May for 2023 and every year thereafter. Um, what's interesting about this new law is, or the new changes, is that in addition to your employees, you also need to provide a separate report of the pay for the employees of any labor contractors that you use, so staffing companies or other contracting organizations. So employers who have 100 or more employees hired through labor contractors uh, within the prior year have to submit a separate pay data report covering just those employees. Um, the report has to also include the names of the owners of all the labor contractors used to supply their employees. And there is a provision that says the labor contractor shall supply all necessary pay data to the private employer. I know that's was has been a, a, an initial point of concern was how are we supposed to get this data? Well, you obviously need to ask for it. Um, and um, there is a requirement on the labor contractor statutorily that they provide it to you. There's also a provision in the um, enforcement and penalty provision that says a court can apportion if you're found to violate this provision and not submit the reports that you have to do um, that um, some of the blame or uh, fault can be attributed to the labor supplier who doesn't provide you with that information. Another change to the reports is that they must also include the median and mean hourly rate within each job category for each combination of race, ethnicity, and sex. Currently, we just uh, fill out the report within certain pay bands, um, but this is going to be added information, and this is an area where I really hope that they give us guidance on what they mean by this and how to put it in that little spreadsheet that gets updated and uploaded. Um, 
uh, a consolidated report is no longer necessary. So you, you might recall if you are those who need to comply with this law that in addition to facility reports, you would need to provide a consolidated report that is no longer going to be required. Um, and then we have some penalty provisions here where if the department requests, the court can impose civil penalties um, from between 100 uh, uh, for a, not to exceed $100 per employee to two for an initial violation and a $200 afterwards. Um, now, this is not subject to PACA. I just want to point that out there. We've had some questions about that. This is, this is an issue that comes up under the government code, which is not subject to PAGA. So even though we see this $100, $200 scheme for penalties, um, we don't believe that that would be subject to a PAGA cause of action. All right. So moving off of pay equity onto another area, uh, Senate Bill 523 is the um, Contraceptive Equity Act of uh, 2022. This um, amends the FIHA to add a new protected characteristic um, for reproductive health decision-making. So those of you who are reviewing your discrimination and harassment policies this year, um, make sure that we add this uh, particular protected characteristic to our laundry list that already exists. Um, so under, the, under this particular bill, he has amended to prohibit employers from discriminating against an employee um, in employment based on their reproductive health decision-making or requiring the disclosure of their reproductive health decision-making as a condition of employment. I honestly hope no one has been doing that up to this point, um, but if you have, that must change. Um, a definition uh, provided by the legislature for reproductive health decision making says that it includes but is not limited to a decision to use or access a particular drug, device, product, or medical service for reproductive health. So this, of course, applies to men as well as women. Um, it applies to all employees. Um, and um, the law also calls for um, health care plans to cover over-the-counter contraceptives and prohibiting them from imposing any cost share requirements for vasectomies starting next year, so January 1, 2024. So we've had some other changes. Changes. I want to talk about a couple of leave entitlements that we saw from the legislature or are seeing from the legislature. And some of these might seem a little benign on the surface, but again, kind of as I was looking through these, I was thinking this could actually be a little bit more complex in effect. Um, so AB 1041, that amends the CIFRA and paid sick leave to now protect leave to care for a quote unquote designated person. Okay, so last year we know CIFRA, we saw some changes to CIFRA, it added parents-in-law, and we had some other changes as well that we saw. Um, this now adds uh, something else um, to uh, men's the government code, as well as the labor code. Labor code is paid sick leave, government code is CIFRA, um, to do this. Now, here's the designated person is different under the CIFRA and PSL definitions. So all it does is say that in addition to uh, providing job protected leave under the CIFRA to care for you know, parent, child, spouse, in-law, et cetera, et cetera, you now have to allow this job protected time off for an employee to care for a designated person. Similar under the paid sick leave, although of course, just for those uses that are allowable under the PSL statute. Um, designated person under CIFRA, is defined as any individual related by blood or whose association with the employee is equivalent of a family relationship. Under the PSL definition, um, it is defined as a person identified uh, um, a person identified by the employee at the time the employee requests paid sick days. So there's no indication under the paid sick leave provision that this designated person has to be related by blood or is some sort of association that is akin to a family relationship. It is just whoever the person designates to you at the time they say that they wanna use this particular paid sick leave. 
Um, so this is really broad. Now, um, this definition of designated person, especially for paid sick leave, um, is also very different from some of the local paid sick leave ordinances that we have out there. You know, if we think about San Francisco, Emeryville, and Oakland, and others that have their own ordinances, right? Those are different from the state, uh, the state paid sick leave. Some of those ordinances allow for an employee to take paid sick leave for a designated person where they don't otherwise have a spouse or registered domestic partner. But note this California statute now does not have that limitation. So it is very, very broad. Uh, so something definitely to keep in mind, um, put that in place with your policies, have a mechanism for employees to designate their designated person. Um, and certainly I would um, also ensure that this is communicated um, in a way that also your managers know that an employee would be entitled to job protected time under CIFRA or PSL for such a designated person. I mean, I can foresee them not knowing and, and, and maybe dismissing inappropriately requests uh, for leave for these reasons. Now, uh, both of the, the CIFRA and the PSL indicate that the employee only has to identify the designated person at the time they're requesting the leave. Um, and we can, we as employers can limit the employee to one designated person per 12 month period um, for the family care medical leave or paid six days. So, you know, it's not like you're, um, you know, they can't kind of change it each month to say, oh, I have a new designated person. Um, we can limit it to one person within the 12 months. So another area of job protected leave that has been uh, put into effect starting January 1 is bereavement leave. Um, and again, this was initially something that is a little, um, you know, we might think is, oh, okay, we get it, we get it. But it's actually pretty complicated when you kind of dig down into it. So I wanted to call it out for you. So AB 1945 adds the right to bereavement leave. It amends both the CIFRA and it adds a new section under the government code um, within, it's, it's also within the CIFRA. So the right to bereavement leave, it applies to employers with five or more employees, and it applies to employees who have been employed 30 days before the start of the leave. And what the statute provides, it provides for up to five days of job protected bereavement leave for the death of a family member. And a family member here, is defined as a parent, child, sibling, grandparent, grandchild, domestic partner, and parent-in-law. So it's kind of the traditional CIFRA uh, definition, but without designated person added. A um, couple things about the bereavement leave. It does not count against your CIFRA time. So it is still job protected. We have some of the other CIFRA provisions apply to this leave, but it does not count against the 12 week bucket of time otherwise available under CIFRA. Um, the bereavement leave must be completed within three months of the individual's death. And generally speaking, it is unpaid, uh, but the employee can use vacation, paid time off, personally PSL, um, or any other available compensatory time. Note how they snuck paid sick leave in there um, as a potential a source of money for uh, this bereavement time. So I'm not gonna go through this particular slide line by line, but a lot of questions came up and the statute actually addresses, how does this law interact with existing employer policies regarding bereavement leave? Most employers, not everyone, but most employers do provide some period of paid time off for bereavement purposes, although it might not be job protected, now it is. Um, so what we need to think about is one, if your policy, you have a policy, a policy applies you know, to the extent it doesn't conflict with some of these statutory provisions. Um, so what if your policy provides for less than five days of bereavement leave? Well, that's fine, but the statute says you have to provide up to five days. Um, and this really comes into play the question of those employers who provide for paid bereavement leave versus unpaid bereavement leave. If your policy provides for paid bereavement leave, let's say it applies three days of paid bereavement leave. Well, then what the law says is that those first three days you're paying under your policy, but then the employee is entitled to the two extra days under the statute, which is unpaid 
but then the employee can choose to apply vacation, PSL, other compensatory time off too. If your policy currently provides for unpaid bereavement leave, then of course the employee now has the option to use any of their other paid, um, you know, paid time off, vacation, et cetera, to use for that. Um, and then if you don't have a policy, well then um, your new policy is going to be consistent with this particular statute. So there is some fine print here um, that uh, you should think about. Um, employees need to provide documentation to support the need for um, this bereavement leave, um, this documentation. You can see the laundry list here of what can be considered adequate documentation. You must keep this documentation confidential. This is in the statute and you shall not disclose it except to internal personnel or counsel as necessary or as required by law. Um, sort of interesting considering a lot of this stuff is public information. I mean, you can go on legacy.com and Google a name, but at least it's trying to say employers, let's not talk about this. Um, we need to maintain it confidential. Um, and then there is, of course, anti-discrimination provision, anti-retaliation provision, and similar to other CIFRA leave, employers cannot interfere with the right to take bereavement leave. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey so he can now talk about some other legislative developments. All right, how's everybody doing today? One of the toughest parts for me about uh, getting the technology to work here. Um, hang on one second. There we go. The toughest parts for me about work doing this is having the uh, ability to see you and interact. Um, first of all, a couple of housekeeping items before I jump into the uh, specific statutes. A couple of things to think about. Um, number one, for those of you who've been with Constangi for a while, uh, you may not recognize me or recognize my name or recognize, we have a San Diego office. Uh, I have to put a little plug in for our San Diego office. Uh, we've had wonderful California offices in, in the Bay Area, LA, and, and Orange County for quite a while. Uh, I joined the firm three months ago and opened San Diego office. So we are now here to serve you from uh, border to border, north and south in California. And look forward to doing that. And, and thank you, Laura, for wonderful things that you've covered. We've been uh, doing what I call drinking from a fire hose. And uh, we're gonna continue to, to barrage you with that. One of the questions that I saw pop up uh, as Laura was speaking has to do with, are you gonna get a copy of the slides? Um, the short answer to that is yes. Uh, you will be getting a copy of the slides uh, when this is over. Uh, for those of you who maybe joined late and didn't hear that. So you'll be getting a copy of the slides. And, that, and again, I think Laura mentioned this, that plays into the fact that you see that our slides are a lot more text heavy than we probably would typically do. Um, we've been on your side of, the, of webinars like this where the slides, if there's too much text, you, you kind of go, oh, what's going on? Why do we need all this? Well, we realize that the delivery format of doing this with a webinar can be a little bit challenging uh, to get everything down because we are moving so quickly. So we've designed these slides to include probably more information uh, than you might normally get in slides from a, from a seminar that you attended live so that you can have a copy of those and have a good reference point to come back and take a look at things. So to answer those questions that have been popping up, that's, uh, that, that's gonna happen with the slides. You will get a copy of the slides. Okay, Laura, can we pop up here our next slide? Uh, dealing with COVID-19 protections. It's not showing up for me right now. Maybe it's just me. It might be just you. Okay, so the slides are showing up. Yes. Okay, all right. I will, I think I have a hard copy in front of me here. I will go with that. Um, all right, so you'll see in your COVID-19 protections, we're not going to spend a lot of time here and we're going to continue with the fire hose theme. We've all, for good or for bad, become very adept as human resource professionals with dealing with all the changes that COVID put into place. We are now in the wind down period for those COVID uh, laws and regulations and, and statutes, uh, hopefully. But we have had a couple of three new uh, COVID statutes come into place that are probably should be on your radar screen if they're not. 
And simply what they have to do is with extending the times that people who are suffering from COVID or are dealing with COVID in the workplace uh, that you have to do a few things. One of those is AB 152. And you'll see on our slide here, basically what this one does is it says that that special COVID supplemental sick time and sick pay that everybody was able to get during the COVID period that popped in as extra paid time off for people because they were dealing with COVID, there's a sunset period on that. So that's gonna, that's gonna sunset the end of this year. So one of the things that I'm already starting to see with my clients is as this law has become uh, noted in the media, social media, things like that, you might see a few more employees all of a sudden having to deal with COVID. And so they're making sure they get that extra paid COVID time. They are entitled to do so as long as they meet those requirements that I know you've already been dealing with for the supplemental COVID pay. If you have any questions, please let us know. But realize there is this is one of the statutes that's going to give us a sunset period. Uh, those workers' compensation pro protections and, and extra things for critical workers uh, under the worker compensation laws those coverage periods and presumptions that we've been dealing with for the last couple of years, uh, those unfortunately will not end at the end of 2022. Uh, those have actually been extended until basically the end of 2023. There's gonna be another year of dealing with those presumptions. I'm sure you're all experts at dealing with it up to now, uh, but just know that uh, unfortunately the, the sunset period on that one has been extended out to another year. Um, but here's a little bit, a piece of good news. Um, as I'm sure you all know, when you've had a situation where you've had exposure uh, to, to COVID in the workplace and you've had to send out those written notices, those letters to people telling them, hey, you've been exposed so that uh, you can deal with that. Um, the legislature now has, has seen fit to allow you to satisfy your obligation of notifying uh, exposed workers by posting a, a notice uh, in the workplace for a 15 day period that will allow you to get the notice to those employees. Uh, so hopefully give you some time savings, some money savings of having to notify people through, through the written format. If we could jump to the next slide, please. All right, um, this is a fun one. I wanna start right off the bat. Um, this is one of the hottest issues in the state of California right now. Uh, as you know, a few years ago, uh, our voters in California approved uh, not just medical marijuana, but recreational marijuana use. Um, and now the legislature has gone to another step. Um, the, that other step is, in my opinion, effectively creating marijuana users as a protected category, just like uh, you know, race, religion, co color, sex, national origin, the other protected categories we have in the state of California. Uh, in many respects, these protections apply in, in the same ways if someone is using marijuana, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, here's the good news. The good news is this does not go into place uh, and become effective until January 1 of 2024. So you as employers have a year to figure out how you're going to deal with this. Um, and we have some time for some potential challenges uh, in the courts or another year worth of legislation to come in and change things. We wanted to bring this up to you so that you can look at it and, and have an idea of what is coming, coming down the pike. But basically what this statute does is it talks about the testing for marijuana. Uh, I, and I, I know many of my colleagues have strongly recommended for many years that you do pre-employment testing um, and that you look for one of, the, one of the drugs that you look for because it is still, even though legal in California, under California statutes, it is still legal, uh, illegal as a controlled substance under federal law. Um, and a, a phrase that's come out of my mouth to my clients many times is those California laws will allow you to stay out of jail in California, but they don't mean you get to work here. Um, the California legislature has decided that they do get to work for you, and I'm sure there are going to be challenges legally to this, um, as long as they don't change things at the federal level with regards to marijuana being uh, and cannabis being continued as legal, illegal substances. So kind of stay tuned on that one. We wanted to give you that heads up, but this statute has to do with testing for, for marijuana for employees and the, the employment actions you can take with regards to those employees. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Oh, one second, I'm trying to get my screen to show up here.
There we go. Um, this is just a quick summary of the medical marijuana, excuse me, of, of the marijuana statute, the new statute that came out that you will have as a reference that you can take a look at. Um, if you could go to the next slide. We'll get, continue with our drinking from the fire hose. Um, this is a, a, a actually a good statute, in my opinion, even though our legislature often uh, and our California state uh, government often does things that are anti for employers, in my opinion. This is one that actually I think provides some good protections uh, that, uh, in my opinion, I can't, I can't believe some employers would be restricting these things, but now it is, it's passed as a statute and it has to do with emergency conditions. Uh, and the focus, this comes out of uh, the unfortunate circumstances where we've had workplace violence, whether that's an employee engaging in workplace violence or heaven forbid, uh, some outside third party coming in uh, to create violence in your workplace. This also uh, can include things such as wildfires, earthquakes, um, you know, severe storms, flooding, things like that that are affecting the workplace. Um, and this law is designed to protect employees in your workplace from retaliation uh, from an employer because they are leaving or not showing up for work because they have a reasonable belief that the workplace is unsafe for whatever reason, whether that's an active shooter, whether that's, you know, uh, a, a fire going on in the area whatever it could be, somebody's being violent in the workplace. Now, it must be a reasonable belief. What does that mean? Uh, that's one of those where you don't get the final answer until a judge makes the decision. But one of the good things about having a Constanji lawyer handy is, you know, we're looking at the cases as this starts to get interpreted and we can help coach you through that. Um, so if you cannot retaliate against an employee, meaning you can't take an adverse action against them uh, if they leave the workplace or refuse to show up for work because they have a reasonable belief the workplace is unsafe. You also, and this is something to look at in your handbooks uh, and your policies, you also cannot prevent the employees from using their mobile devices, cell phone, whatever it might be, um, or other communication device to seek emergency assistance, um, you know, if they will need to assess the safety of the workplace where we see this becoming an issue is, you know, you can't have your phone out, you know, during work. Um, if somebody needs to use their phone to assess a, a threat situation, uh, they cannot be prevented from doing that. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. This is a quick one that we're gonna cover. We'll leave the slide in so you can get a copy of it. This has to do with those of you who have call centers. Um, the California WARN Act, W-A-R-N, has to do with the closing or relocation of large employment workplaces. Um, if you've been involved in, in relocating or, or selling your business uh, or closing a, a plant or a center somewhere in California, you've had to deal with the California WARN Act, which has notice requirements that, that must be given to all the employees and to certain government officials. Um, there's been some questions and, and you know, exemptions dealing with call centers. People have found ways around that. Employers have found ways around the, the, the California WARN Act. This statute basically brings call center workers within the scope of California WARN, and uh, there are certain notice requirements that have to go on. We're not going to spend a lot of time because uh, that may not apply to everyone, but if that does apply to you and you have other questions, please, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to answer them. Go to the next slide, please. Ha, ah, this is a fun one. This is a slide that in different forms has been in every new laws seminar that I've been a part of in the almost 30 years I've, I've been doing and part of these seminars at the various places I've worked. The simple point is in California, I, I know most of you are in California, but we have a number of you that are outside of California with employees in the state of California. California's wage hour laws for for large part when you're dealing with exemptions are based on two times the minimum wage, uh, not uh, some threshold that's set in the FLSA. So every time minimum wage increases in the state of California, we like to remind our employers, remind our clients, make sure that you are adjusting your thresholds for those exemptions to meet the salary test portion of those exemptions 
uh, including the computer professionals exemption uh, to correlate with the update in California's minimum wage laws. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You can see the number to the short answer is if someone is going to be considered exempt under one of the white collar statutes in the state of California going forward into the next year, they're going to need to be making a salary of uh, essentially $65,000 a year. You can see the exact number there, 64480. But uh, they still need to meet a duties test. Do not misread or misunderstand us that, oh, they're exempt if they make 65,000 a year. There's still a duties test. They need to uh, make sure they, they meet those standards. But the salary is now going to be, for all intents and purposes, about $65,000 a year. Go ahead and we can go to the next slide. Um, some cases. Th those are the main statutes. There's a few other statutes out there, um, but these are the big ones that we see people perhaps stumbling over. We're going to now move into some cases and give you some quick case summaries. This is one that was around, has been around for a while. Um, it deals with a very narrow yet has become a very, very common lawsuit du jour for the plaintiff's bar in the state of California and suing employers. There are effectively two different retaliation statutes that the state of California employers have to deal with. One is the FEHA retaliation, the Fair Employment and Housing Act, which deals with retaliation based on race, religion, color, sex, national origin, all those protected categories. This statute crosses over and deals with the labor code retaliation statute, which is found in labor code 1102.5. Um, for years, people like Laura and I have used uh, the burden shifting standard found in the McDonnell Douglas versus Green case uh, in the defense of 1102.5 labor code retaliation claims. That's been the standard. The Lawson case is a case that came out uh, within the last year, and it actually says, no, that burden shifting of the McDonnell Douglas case, the standard set forth in the McDonnell Douglas case does not apply in an 1102.5 labor code retaliation claim. They focus back on the framework that is set forth in 1102.6 uh, of the statute in the labor code. Um, and this really is an evidentiary standard case. And I'm not going to get too legalese and lawyerly on you. Uh, just suffice it to say that uh, we've all watched Law and Order and we hear about the preponderance of the evidence, clear and convincing evidence, and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, with the middle standard being clear and convincing evidence. Well, in a 1102.5 retaliation case, the employee is going to have the burden using the lowest level, which is preponderance of the evidence, that the bad act of whatever it was of retaliation that you took against the employee, uh, they have a low threshold to meet the initial part of their prima facie case. The burden then will shift to the employer to prove with a medium which is still higher standard, a clear and convincing evidence standard to show that you actually did not retaliate for an unlawful reason because they complained about uh, wages, so to speak, as the, as the bad act, um, that you actually had a legitimate non-discriminatory reason, but you're now going to have to prove that using a clear and convincing evidence standard. It makes it a little bit more difficult. The takeaway for all of you on this one is, if you are terminating somebody who has recently, or not just terminating, doing anything adverse to an employee who has in recent memory made a complaint regarding their wages or anything under the labor code, please, please, please touch base with one of us, get some legal advice to step you through this standard because it's a lot easier to avoid this lawsuit uh, going into it than it is to defend against that particular statute. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Laura for a, a few more things, and we'll get close to wrapping up here. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. You, you, Corey's right. I will just mention one thing with 1102.5 and a trend that I've been seeing with my cases out in California is that almost every case now has an 1102.5 cause of action added in. And I'll say probably about four or five, six, seven years ago, that wasn't the case. It seemed to be more reserved. Um, or used more sparingly, but over the past couple of years, the legislature has been chipping away, making it broader and broader. It was already a very broad uh, private whistleblower statute 
you know, employee only needs to complain about something that they reasonably believe is unlawful and they can complain to whomever they want. And now we have attorney's fees available under it. And now we have this heightened standard of proof on employers. So um, I'm definitely seeing more and more of these cases um, go through. And I think the impact that we'll see after the Lawson decision is that um, it is going to be harder to get out of these cases on summary judgment. Um, that's, that's probably the net sum, as if it wasn't hard enough. <laughs> Litigating in California, um, you know, the deck is, is stacked a little bit more slightly against us as employers. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of cases. Um, one of which was highlighted last year as one to watch. Um, and then just to kind of give you a little bit of a roadmap where we go, we want to talk about, or Corey wants to talk about um, arbitration, um, post Viking River cruises, impact on PAGA cases, what we've been seeing um, in terms of court rulings and, and things from opposing counsel in dealing with, uh, with that decision in PAGA. So, so bear with us a little bit and then we'll get to the Q&A. So the first case I wanted to talk about was the Grande versus Eisenhower Medical Center case. And we previewed this last year for y'all because um, it's an interesting case involving whether um, an employee of a staffing company who sues the staffing company um, for labor code violations, et cetera, et cetera, um, settles with the staffing company, but then brings a copycat suit against the client company where they worked whether they can continue to bring their copycat case against the um, client uh, organization. And the Texas Supreme Court in this particular instance said, yes, they can. Um, and so um, it was a little bit shocking, but it was also very much based on the particular facts of this case. It was based on the contractual language at issue. Um, and the relationship between the staffing company and its client company, as well as the language in the settlement agreement between the staffing company and um, the employee when they resolve the employee suit. So um, just a little bit of context for this. Um, as I mentioned, there was a staffing company that placed nurses at hospitals. One of those hospitals was Eisenhower, who is the subject of this particular suit. The nurse sued the staffing agency for violating the labor code and the unfair competition law in California, brought a class action. Um, they settled and the court entered judgment on the settlement. So far, everything kind of as it's supposed to go, as we see in these cases. Well, now the hospital was not a party to that initial lawsuit, nor were they mentioned or referenced in any way in that particular settlement agreement. Um, the nurse then sued the hospital under some sort of joint employer theory based on the same allegations. The hospital tried to argue that she can't get two bites at this apple, that her claims were precluded by a prior settlement under this doctrine, this legal doctrine called claim preclusion. Um, and that is a doctrine that basically um, prohibits some individuals from getting two bites at an apple when once a, a court has rendered judgment on a particular claim or set of claims you, you can't you're done right you can't go back and, and keep relitigating those same claims that's a very high level summation of this doctrine of claim preclusion so the hospital tried to say hey listen you can't get two bites at this apple you've already settled your claims against the staffing company you can't now bring them against us the court said no, the employee can proceed. The settlement agreement that um, released the staffing company that that other judgment was based on did not mention um, Eisenhower either by name, by relationship. It did not apply to clients of the staffing agency. Um, there's nothing in there that indicates that that agreement was intended to cover Eisenhower or other clients of the staffing agency. Those of you who have seen settlement agreements, either severance agreements with employees who are exiting or settlement agreements in, in uh, lawsuits, see that there are so much legalese in there and the release paragraph applies to parents, companies, successors, assigns, employees, directors, officers, insurers, and like this like four lines of release parties. Um, there is nothing in this laundry list that indicated a client company would be covered. 
Um, Eisenhower is not considered an agent of the staffing company. So, um, so that was one kind of takeaway from this. Um, the court also found that the um, employer and, or sorry, the client company Eisenhower was not kind of otherwise kind of in privity, you know, any have some sort of special relationship oops, that would indicate that they should have been covered. So, it um, while this language, this language, this court decision is very much an eye opener for those of us who represent, who are staffing companies or if you work with a staffing company, you want to make sure um, that you can take steps so that um, individuals can't get two bites out of the apple um, when it comes to raising labor code claims. Um, and that can be by looking at your contractual terms with uh, between the two. It can be talking about um, improving language that's in the settlement agreements to be even more inclusive. Um, but now um, we have this guidance finally from the Supreme Court. The other case that I'm going to mention before turning it over to Corey to talk about arbitration is this Naranjo versus Spectrum Services case. And this case asks, um, it involves a very technical issue under our um, uh, labor code dealing with meal and rest period pre uh, premiums, pay statements, and waiting time penalties, all the little, you know, um, hodgepodge mishmash that we get when we see our pocket claims or our labor code claims. And, um, you know, wage statement claims and waiting time penalty claims oftentimes are just derivative of these meal and rest period claims. An employee will say, I didn't get my meal and rest periods. You owe me uh, premium pay. You owe me for that time worked. Oh, and by the way, my wage statements weren't correct. And oh, by the way, you owed me this money and on termination and you didn't give it to me. So you owe me waiting time penalties too. So as you can imagine, courts dealt with this in a lot of different ways. The Supreme Court, uh, address this to sort of resolve some of the conflict that occurred in the appellate court. So in this particular case, um, the plaintiff filed a class action alleging meal period and rest period violations, um, as well as these derivative claims for waiting time penalties and wage statement violations. Um, it actually went to a trial. The employer lost on the meal period claim. Um, the court found then that the employer was also liable for the derivative wage statement violations. It did not, the employer did not include the meal period premiums that it should have had to owe on the wage statements, um, but found that it wasn't liable for waiting time penalties because that omission was not willful. Now, both sides appealed. Um, the appeals court um, agreed um, with the award of meal period premiums being owed, but then said that this doesn't ent entitle the employees to recover for the derivative wage statement and waiting time penalties claim. The Supreme Court comes in and reverses that course and says that the meal period and rest period premiums must be reported on the wage statement. And in so finding, it found that they were akin to wages, which is a little bit of a, of a turnaround from other cases. But this is very clear because this is clear direction that our wage statements must include uh, line items for the meal period premiums and the rest period premiums. Otherwise, we're at risk for finding uh, a wage statement violation. The court also found that the premiums had to be paid within the statutory deadline for wages upon separation of employment. So it said, even though this is derivative, if you don't pay these meal and rest period premiums by termination, then employer is subject to waiting time penalties for that. So this is a very big wake up call. Um, for employers as if we needed another wake up call. Uh, it's a wake up call for us to, uh, again, make sure that our meal and rest period practices are up to snuff, that we are paying premiums if we uh, are not uh, providing meal and rest periods as required, that these are showing up on our pay statements and that upon termination of employment, we are making sure that employees are the best we can have received payment for those meal and rest period premiums. Otherwise, that will subject us to waiting time penalties. So um, I know we're at, we want to wrap up and talk about PAGA and arbitration. So I'm going to turn back over to Corey 
<clears throat> All right. We, uh, how do you like my fire hose so far? It, you've been getting quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to actually turn the fire hose up a little bit. Uh, and we're going to kind of, this is why we put this, the heavy slides in here with a lot of text, because these next few slides deal with the arbitration issues. But I'm going to give you just a quick summary, because you've probably heard of some of these cases, uh, such as the Viking River Cruises case. Um, basically, in a nutshell, the question, what's going on with arbitration in California? Um, Viking River Cruises has been dealing with the arbitration issue, particularly in the PAGA context, uh, for the last year or so. <clears throat> the short answer, uh, along with Viking River Cruises, is California also, as you may recall, a couple of years ago, passed a, a new law deal that would basically prohibit arbitration in the state of California, with mandatory arbitration by employers. Uh, that law was challenged in, in what's called the Bonta case, uh, and that is still up in front of the California courts in, in the Ninth Circuit right now. Uh, and it, both of these have kind of been ping pong balls as to whether you can do mandatory arbitration, whether pocket cases affect arbitration, can pocket cases be forced into arbitration, whether you stay the other claim, stay the pocket claims while you're dealing with arbitration of the individual claims. The short answer as it sits right now is we're still waiting to hear from the Ninth Circuit on mandatory versus voluntary arbitration. Uh, until we have a final decision on that, employers can still have and require mandatory arbitration agreements with their employees. And that is a strong recommendation. Of course, your circumstances, as they say, your mileage may vary uh, with your company. Uh, we encourage you to please get a hold of one of your Constangi lawyers. Uh, we have lots of lawyers who are very up to date. Uh, including myself and Laura on these issues, and we can guide you through this. We have arbitration agreements that have been upheld by courts uh, in these circumstances that we can help you get into place. And, and I personally strongly recommend arbitration. It's a great way to kill class action cases. Uh, it's a way to allow you to get a hold of those claims uh, and have a, a, an, an arbitrator make a decision instead of a, of a jury or a court where you could be you know, stuck with decisions that you don't like a lot easier uh, or a lot more often. Um, so that, that's kind of where we stick, sit with arbitration as far as implementing it. One point, if you do have arbitration in place and you do get a demand for arbitration, uh, there is new California law in the last year that is being enforced by our courts that if you do not pay, because the employer is required to pay for the arbitration, if you do not pay for that arbitration fee, in a timely manner, the plaintiff will be able to run back to court and say they didn't play by the rules that they set about arbitration. They didn't pay for it. We want to be back in court and have a jury deciding this instead of a, an arbitrator. Uh, so tip of the day, make sure that you and your counsel, hopefully it's us, if not, whoever you're using is keeping an eye on making sure that you get that arbitration fee paid in time so that you do not uh, get accused of, of waiving your arbitration rights that you've worked so hard to protect. We, uh, we're, we're now going to kind of jump into some quick questions and answers, and I'm going to take the first one because we're down to just a couple of minutes left. There was a question that came through uh, on, on our, uh, our chat function about whether or not you could use an oral fluid test for the, for the marijuana situation um, if, if to, to kind of get around the prohibition on testing for marijuana. Well, the statute in California that is going into effect in 2024 uh, prohibits testing for the marijuana related metabolites is the word that they use in the science. Uh, from any bodily fluid uh, or for hair testing or anything. So basically, if you're using any test, there are certain things that you cannot test for in that test. It's not the type of test that is going to control. It is what that test is going to be looking for. I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, if it didn't or you have further follow-up questions, please uh, get a hold of us and let us know. Laura, did you have any other questions? I will say this. We've had a lot of good questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them and keep you uh, on time, but we do have them. We know who you are and we will, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
push our team here that we will get uh, a, a list of FAQs or something like that out with you when we send out the slides so that you'll be able to, to see the answers to the questions that uh, pertain to everyone. And if you have specific individual questions, please get a hold of each of us. We'd be more than happy to answer them and help you through this. That's what we're here for, help make your life easier. Thank you. Laura, thanks for including me. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending. And again, we will um, absolutely be following up with you. Apologies, we couldn't get to the questions, uh, but you know, we'll send you the slides. We'll send you the information um, regarding uh, your credit. And uh, thanks. Take care. Be safe out there, everyone.